Hi, I'm Jared Huckabee, and I'd like to discuss with you your rights and responsibilities in the proper storage and maintenance of cheese. Now, I know it's not cool to take care of the cheese, but look at me. I'm cool, right? I'm, I'm cool, and I take care of the cheese. When taking care of the cheese, there are three things I need you to remember. I like to call them the three H's. You need head, you need heart, and you need small plastic containers. Joining us on our discussion of taking care of the cheese is lead environment artist, John Griffiths. John, how you doing? Hello. I'm good, thank you, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have no idea what I was doing. What, what, what was that? Something about cheese, right? I don't know. What is your favorite cheese? I'm like, I don't, there's only like seven foods I like in the whole world, so I'm just like, I know it's technically not cheese. Like, there's actually a law in the States that says they can't call this cheese. It's a, it's American cheese product, but I like American cheese product. It's, okay. But like I said, my, I, my culinary opinion should not be the basis for anything. Uh, for as far as actual cheese, I really like a good applewood smoked. Okay. Cheddar. Okay. Yeah. Those things they have in the kitchen, the little, the little pre-wrapped applewood smoked, smoked cheddar. Yeah. Blocks. I, I, I take those a lot. Yeah, great, yeah. I, I like brie, but if it's a hot day and it's melting, it's, that's not really for me. Um, or blue cheese, that when you get older, really nice. I've never had blue cheese. Have you not? I, I, it, it's the, there's something about the term blue cheese, it just, it just bothers me. It's got mold in it. <laughs> oh, doesn't, doesn't all cheese have some element of oh, that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. So what, like, yeah, but you get the visual of it as well. Yeah, maybe that's it. I never I had a visual. I just didn't like the idea of blue cheese. So I just. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, welcome to Star Citizen Live. Uh, as we're over here, Star Citizen Live uh, Game Dev One on One. Uh, I'm your host, Jared Huckabee. And it's been one of those days. Uh, we're here on our set, The Only Constant. We've pivoted things around a little bit, so you're seeing a section of the spaceship you uh, don't normally see. You see our lovely uh, helmet collection over here. Um, on today's show, uh, we're not going to talk so much about uh, stuff that's coming down the pipeline, stuff that's currently in, the pro uh, in progress. Uh, we're going to talk about process. Uh, how we work, uh, how things are made in general, and how uh, uh, people uh, choose to get into this business and, 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 and stay when there are so many other things they could be doing. <laughs> it would probably pay them more money, but we do it anyway. Uh, joining me on uh, uh, this trip today is lead environment artist, uh, 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 John Griffiths. Uh, and John, uh, let's start off real simply by telling folks uh, what it is that a lead environment artist does. Um, okay, so it might differ from company to company. Uh, so just bear that one in mind. But generally, it's your job to make, lead the team on what it is you're making, what, what it is you're creating. And it's um, you're mentoring artists, you're also recruiting artists, you're looking at the pipeline, things that we, you could do to improve it, um, any processes. Um, you've also got to see, uh, got to do a bit of, or I, I think you should do anyway, um, scheduling. Um, how much, do we have the, the, the right amount of resource to do the thing that we actually want to do? Um, so that's why, you know, in every video I've been on, there's been a bit of Excel in there as well. Uh, just, can't get away from it. Um, but yeah, you, it's your, you know, you're the one who's holding the banner, as it were, and saying, this is what we're making. Come on, guys, let's do this. And girls, or whoever. And how long have you been with CIG? I've been at CIG for... What day is it? It's the 8th? It's the 9th. The ninth. So actually, I, I mean, I, I can't do the perfect maths, but I've been here for a year and 11 months and it will be 12 months next month. Right. And in, in the industry? And in the industry. So I worked, so I did 
I've done four and a half years in animated film and then the rest is games. So probably about seven or, or eight. Is that, hold on, so, yeah, something, something like that. Maybe even nine, maybe even nine. You're watching game devs attempt to do math. Yeah. Twitch.tv yeah. slash star citizen. Have a look at math. It's, it's on my CV. So. It's just <laughs> counting. It's not even math. It's just counting. Um, now, there are different types of artists in game development. There, 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 there's, you're an environmental artist. There's props artists. There's, there's uh, you know, character artists, stuff like this. Uh, what, are the, what, what are the duties of an environmental artist? So we're building the world in which you are playing. So everything you, if you take out our role, then you'll just be playing in blank space, um, you know, white or gray, that's it. Um, our job is to make it so that the world you're in is as seamless as possible. And for me, if anything, you know, we're supporting the gameplay, but it's also our job to try and help you feel like you're in this world. I think anything that potentially breaks the player out of their feeling of that place, we haven't really done our job right. So the longer we can keep you feeling like you're in, well, for us, like a sci-fi universe or for other games, I don't know, a jungle or a lava planet or whatever, um, keeping the player thinking that they're in this reality, uh, that's my job, yeah, that's pretty cool. Now, even within the team, within the environment team, there's, there's also different kinds of artists. There's concept artists, there's technical artists. Uh, uh, walk me through the, the kinds of artists that, that, that exist to create these assets. So we have, um, or let's say in general, you'll have concept artists. So they're primarily a bit of 3D and 2D, uh, painting pictures, let's say. They're given, creating, coming up with the ideas, creating kind of inspiration for the team to then kind of run with. Um, to follow suit with what you were saying, technical artists, they're more focused on how we make stuff with the tools we have. So less about making things pretty, more about how can we give, make this tool easier for more people to use. Um, so, that I'm probably really simplifying <laughs> saying, it. Sorry, the, the, any the, the, technical the, artists out there. Yeah, tech artists are also the ones who, who take your gorgeous LOD zero work and then smoosh it down often. And, you know, to, yeah, to, to, I mean, to, we, to, environmental artists do that a bit as well. But essentially, it has to be able to run. Um, so that's why we need the level of detail assets. Um, and, you know, I think... Most times they hold up quite well from, you know, quite a far distance. But, you know, that also means that we can have more stuff loaded in as well at any one point. Um, yep, so character artists, well, I mean, this is just in the art team in general. Uh, names on the tin, I suppose. So they make characters. Um, prop artists, again, props. So I would say, you know, maybe this chair would be a prop. Whereas the studio would be an environment. I think where, where I want to go with this though is, is there, there's, there's, when I say different types of artists, I mean there's, there's hard surface modelers. There's, uh, there, there's folks who focus on organics. Like even yeah. Just within the environment team, there are different types of artists who specialize in different types of assets. Mm. Because an environment is everything from, like I said, the, you know, the desert and the forest full of trees to an underground facility and whatnot, and the aptitudes for both of those are different. Mm. You know, so, someone who excels at making foliage, excels at making a, you know, uh, sci-fi plants that look like they're from another world, might not have the same aptitudes to make, you, you, you know, underground bunkers that look like, you know, they're, they're pristine and, 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 and uh, sterile and stuff like mm. that. So talk to me about the different types of of artists like like i said between like the, the the hard surface stuff the organic stuff so with the hard surface uh, so a lot of our i would say our environment artists are hard surface artists um and they are creating yeah things like this studio for example uh walls floors anything that the player is kind of walking on or at least can see um 
that's what they're doing. With organics, yes, it, it's more, they're concerned about nature, so trees, plants, mining things, uh, rocks, whatever. But it's also the job of, I suppose, you know, artists on my team in particular to marry the organic and the hard surface together. So just because you're focusing on, you know, you're a hard surface artist, you're focusing on hard surface, hard surface you've got to think about how these, all these elements come together. Because if it's just kind of natural rock and then metal, that's going to look a bit weird. Um, whereas if we think about how it blends in, is there a structure in place, is there a bit of a transition for it, then that's going to be better and that's keeping more in with that, what I was saying before about keeping people in the world that you're building. Within hard service artists, are there divisions even within that? I, I, there's, so in our company we do have, um, so we have several different levels of artist from, um, so we have uh, artists one, two, and three, and then senior one and two. Then you've got leads and principals, and then it's on into assistant art direction, art direction, senior art direction, mm -hmm. all that jazz. Um, so when you're starting out in the industry, you're likely to be going into like an entry level role. Um, so for us, that's artist one. And you know, after that, it's up to you in a way. It's kind of how much do you want to put in? How much do you want to do it? And how you execute things as well. Um, and then we're here as well. You know, people who leads and seniors are there to help the other, the kind of the lower um, levels out because ultimately we want them to grow as well. So everyone moves up the chain together. Uh, so if you're just joining us now, we're hanging out with lead environment artist John Griffiths. We're talking about a process this week, how things work, uh, the, the, the very nature of making games as opposed to any specific features that's coming out on the roadmap and stuff. Uh, you can check out Inside Star Citizen and stuff for that. Uh, I want to, you said there were seven levels. Now even within that, artist one, two, and three, they're variations of, of each other. Uh, then there's seniors, then there's lead, then there's stuff. So I'd like to talk to, the, to those four breakdowns mm -hmm. for a bit. What's, what's an average day for an artist? Like an, an artist in game development, is it, is it just that they, they, they come in and draw some shit for eight hours and somebody tells them whether that's good or not? It's like, like walk, walk me through what the day for... for... I mean, uh, it, it can be. I'm sure it can be. Um, <laughs> as somebody who's considering doing this as a job. Okay, so I would say if you're considering being an artist, then you need to at least work out which kind of artist you want to be. You know, do you want to go into props? Do you want to go into characters? Do you want to go into environment? Do you want to go into technical? Do you want to go into concept? Because if you don't really know what you want to do when you enter then chances are you're not, you, <laughs> you're not gonna like it, <laughs> probably. Um, whereas if you have some kind of inclination of, oh, you know, I, I wanna do environments, I want to go to a company where I can just do environments day in, day out. Um, in a company like ours, you know, because we're so big, it's, you need to have your focus going in. But if for a, kind of a much smaller company, you might be tasked, you might wear several hats, so you might be an environment artist, but you also do props and vehicles and a bit of set dressing or something like that. Um, so if you were coming in and what your day would look like as say, let's say an art, artist one is, um, you, do an, you do art, you know? <laughs> okay, yeah, so we do have several meetings that you need to attend, like we have, um, uh, what not daily, but every other day, we have like a stand up or a sync with the whole team. Um, by the whole team, it's kind of the location team. Um, people run through their tasks. We catch up on um, if anyone wants to kind of show where they're up to or they want any feedback. It's a great time for that. That's kind of out, that's not just art as well, that's working with design, uh, both mission and um, level design. Uh, and then you you, you just crack on, you continue doing with what you're doing. Uh, so in, in their case, it might be 
on the UGFs, you know, they're building rooms at the moment. So, so that's what they're, so that's what you would do. What kind of tools are they working with? So we use 3ds Max here, um, and it's pretty great, I think, because we use the stack quite. If, if, if anyone's you know used 3ds Max, you have a stack in it, and it basically allows us to make very quick changes um, without having to really affect the geometry too much, and um, it means that we can see our results faster in the editor and so for us it's literally 3ds max and the editor and a go between uh, with other things uh, so with the uh, what you call it the uh, organics guys they um, will have zebrush in their pipeline they'll also have houdini in their pipeline um, so there's probably a bit in and out of different software before it comes into the editor but um, yeah it's actually quite easy to say these are the tools we use. I think we offset, we do use Substance Suite as well, mm -hmm. um, and in particular, uh, Substance Designer for texture generation. You know, again, procedural, so it's not as though you're sculpting something and have to re-sculpt it. You can, if the art director says um, less pipes, you can just go pipe number to one, and then you're done. Mm. So that's quite great. I want to follow up on something you said. You, you mentioned that some uh, some folks do environments and they all, they moonlight and props and weapons and ships. I I don't think I I I've I've known people who have moved from one team to another. I don't I, I can't think of anybody who's actively working on both ships and environments. And so like this, I I want to disabuse that there's a common misconception uh, in the view of all game development, not just ours or any, anything like that, that everybody can just work on everything. Oh yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't <laughs> so do I that. To just abuse that uh, uh, from that point that you said before. Well, I'm going to counter it because um, in a company like ours or large companies, you have to have people kind of more strict on what people are working on because otherwise, nothing will get done, and you'd have a lot of people working on the same thing, which doesn't really work. Well work that well whereas I would say in smaller companies and I mean indie startup type things less than 20 people you're going to be more useful to them if you can do more things so the reason because this is how I started when I was working in film animated film I what, what, what did I I think I joined as a character artist I hated characters, <laughs> doing character art. It's just not for me. Um, and I kind of moulded it, went from that. Well, actually, I was, I was probably a little clever. I knew a character artist at the time, so I got her employed so she could do characters and then I could do the thing that I wanted to do. Um, so that's why I started doing environments. But because we were a small studio, we, I think uh, I was number seven to join. And you couldn't just sit there and be like, oh, I've, I've done the props now, that's me done for this film. It was, okay, we need these environments doing, we need these vehicles doing, we need the set dressing doing. I also did baking of, of animation, so the animators would do their thing and then we'd bake it all into, I can't even remember what file format now, it was so long ago. And then we'd get that into, we were rendering in Lightwave mm -hmm. at the time. So, we're, you know, this was 2010, we're yeah. talking. Um, but that's why I, I, I wanted to caveat and say, massively depending on the studio, right. you know, the size of the studio is how many hats you'll be wearing. But then it's one of those things where when you, when you grow, when you scale up and whatnot, it becomes important to have people specialized in, yeah. in certain areas because pe people that tend to bounce from one discipline to another discipline, end up doing neither one particularly effectively. At, at, at lower levels, the indie studios, like you said, it's, it's, it's a necessary evil. Mm, it's a necessary, mm. well, evil's not too strong a word. It's, <laughs> it, it's necessary because you just, we only have six people and these things need to get done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, when, you, when you scale to the, size, to, to the size of the company that we're at and whatever, it becomes important to let the platform people do platform, mm. to let the character people do character, to let the, you know, the environment people do environment, stuff like that. I'd also say that 
just because you're say an environment artist and you're working in a bigger company you're not just hey make this room next thing make this room next thing you're also got to think about and especially the kind of the higher you go up the tiers um, you're more responsible not only for your work but also other people's work and so you're wearing several hats becomes very kind of central to that role itself um, so it's kind of how is the team setting things up how are we naming things how uh, yeah naming yeah naming things. conventions oh. yeah yeah right. you want to be a lead right <laughs> the number of arguments that are had in any game project over well steve thinks it should be it, it should be you know month date year and ted thinks it should be it should be day you know year month and, and it, i'm just using the most obvious examples or whatever are legendary and they persist years into a project because you think you think you have it settled down, and then some new situation comes up, and the naming convention for things that you've been using for the last four years is no longer appropriate, and so you have to change. Then you, you I mean, you don't want to just, you know, you don't want to tell anybody they can't have an opinion. You want, you you want to, you want to be open to the to the better idea wherever it comes from. So there's this there's there's this Hunger Games that happens for, for things like that. It's, yeah, it's a uh, you you really are trying to. Future, you, you've got the information right now, and you're thinking, okay, but what about in the future? How is it going to, in six months' time, when we look back, are we going to actually be able to find what it is we're looking for? And that's what naming is all about. Um, and no matter, you've got to get it wrong a few times before you get it right. And even when you get it right, you think, oh, I've got this slightly wrong, but we're just going to have to live with it now because too many people are using these assets. It's weird to think about how important naming is to the life of an artist, mm. but, I mean, it, it is. There's, there's you know, in, uh, folks, who have, folks who have explored the files, uh, the file structure of, of Star Citizen over the year, you know, have seen, you know, a gray cat be referred to as Grin, you know, internally, back when we, back when we were doing everything with a four-letter acronym for all the different manufacturers and stuff. And there, there are times where even in our own documentation, even in our own public documentation, we'll, inst we'll, we'll instinctively use the, ac the internal acronyms that are not supposed to be external acronyms, and, and, and it, can, it ends up confusing things, and it's just, it's a, it's a naming is... Naming is a, is a special trauma that I think all game developers share. I think I'd also like to say it's if you're a student right now, think about your naming, think about your folders, think about <laughs> your names, because you'll get, into a, you'll get closer to your deadline time and you'll be like, fine, underscore final, underscore <laughs> one. Underscore, underscore really this, this one. Yeah, exactly. One's capitalized, one isn't. And you're just going to be, it's just not the way. No. So, um, yeah, please just make it easier on yourself. You can do it. <laughs> it's a meme, but it's one of those things that's a meme for a reason because everybody in this industry goes through it at every level. Uh, and I don't think you ever really escape it. Uh, we, we, we've got people, you know, producers, you know, one of the many tasks of a producer is just to wrangle that beast that never quite gets wrangled. Um, before we move into seniors and stuff, uh, uh, as a final thing on, on, on just the artist level, how much, how much agency would you say an, art, uh, an artist has? It, it, when you come in, if you're an artist one or an artist two, are you just doing what other people tell you to do and you don't get to create for yourself? You don't get to... Uh, talk, talk to me about how agency works, uh, how, how people at all levels get to contribute and shape the direction of something. So here, you, everyone gets an input um, on what you're doing. As in, not as in everyone's <laughs> <laughs> looking at your work going, do this, do this, do this. But you as an artist, you're free to change things. You know, we have to stick to what the white box was, um, you know, because- Metrics and stuff. It metrics has and stuff like that. It has to matter why. And, and um, you know, there's a reason why we do that stage. Um, you know, Little things around that, so maybe when we come to putting the art in, you think, oh, you know, this space would uh, benefit if it was, if this wall was four meters over, just gives us a bit more room to set dress or do something like, 
fine. But actually changing a puzzle, that's not really okay. Um, but it's kind of like, for us, you know, we're only able to create these worlds because it's not just one person making them and dictating what it is. It's the individual artists actually kind of putting their own spin on things or going, okay, these are the assets that I've got available to me. How can I use this, use these things in different ways to create more variation of one space? And so we really, you know, it's great. It's great to work with people who just kind of, you give them the stuff and they just run with it. And that's they, they, they put as much of themselves in where they, where they can. I think the, the, one of the things that happens when you tell the story of a game's development over the course of a decade while you're making it, uh, hi everybody, uh, is that you know, new people come in and they come in with new ideas at, at any level. They, they, they come in with new processes, they come in with new technologies, they come in with new experiences, and they come in with, oh, well, I think, okay, you brought me in, and yes, you've got this roadmap for this, stuff like this, but when it, it goes, I think it would be more interesting if we changed that from blue to red, or, you know, it's like this, and then and the, it, having that agency, you know, it, that, that ability to uh, suggest those things and to bring a bit of yourself to it is a, is a, is a hallmark of many game uh, studios. I'm not going to sit here and talk for every game studio in the world, but it certainly applies to ours. We were just, when, we, when I went to grab you for this, we walked past somebody's uh, desk. I don't know who's, who it was. I'm a desk. Uh, they have a, on their screen was a little potted plant that they were, that they were building. Uh, for you know, it's obviously probably some somebody from the props team. They're building a little potted plant, but on the table was a live was their live plant that they, you know, take care of and they water. And it was very easy to see the similarity. It was it was hey, I've got to make a plant for this anyway. I might as well you know put a little bit of me into mm, this. Mm. And I really like that aspect of game development. It, it's, it's, there's so many aspects of a game that uh, most people will just gloss over. It's like, no, that, that, was, that was my plant, or, or that, that was my mom's clock. You know, it's, 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 you have to make it anyway, so w places where you can personalize and, and, and bring yourself into it are always a, a, a win for me. Um, so that's, that's our artist. Above that is a senior. Mm -hmm. So what's a senior do? Just kick back and let the artist do all the work? Nah. Just try to nah. piss off. Um, no, seniors are, um, they, they've generally, they've been in, in the industry um, for longer. They have more experience. They've kind of gone through the ringer a couple of times, <clears throat> let's say. That's a good way to put it. Um, you know, other companies or whatever, it could be that they've worked on release titles, so they've experienced the whole pipeline from start to finish. Um, and, you know, the, you know, the problems that go with that, whether you're releasing on PC, whether you're re releasing on um, console, um, generally they're more, their time management skills are a lot more honed. They know kind of pretty much how long something will take and they will stick to that. Um, they're also there to help mentor the um, more junior um, artists as well. You know, again, they've got more experience, they've got more under, a, kind of a better understanding, I suppose, of the tools. And then it's just about helping others out where we can. Um, also, it's, yeah, it, I think it's experience really for them, it comes down to, um, which is great. Uh, and then from senior you go to lead. So there we split. Yeah, exactly. So we've, as you're going up the ranks, you're like, I'm an artist, I want to be an artist. And then you could be like, okay, well, what, what does my career path look like? And you could say, well, I just want to do art my whole career. So maybe- Not everybody's interested in management. Not yeah, ex exactly. And filling out reviews and yeah, yeah, yeah. HR paperwork and- oh. yeah. <laughs> God, you made my job sound so glamorous. Um, <laughs> um, so you could go into principal. So with your principal, you're basically, you're, you, you, here is a blank scene and we want it to look like this. 
and it's your job to kind of just make that and you can you can you've, you're highly proficient in the software you're highly proficient in your kind of um you know what looks cool what doesn't look good um and you just you really just go and make so if you want a, an art role where you're just making stuff day in day out that looks cool every time that's what the principle looks like um on the other side of the bridge it's more management based and that's where this comes in <laughs> okay i couldn't think of the words so i went with the uh, uh -huh. the hands <laughs> Uh, so, so as a lead, then you don't do any art. No, I do. I, I do do a little right. bit. Um, so I was, um, as you're aware, it, or if you've seen the ISCs, I was heavily involved in the white boxing of the location because, to me, you know, being able to play the location so early in development is really crucial. Um, so I'm, I'm a big part of that. Um, but actually, when you were came to collect me earlier, I, um, I've started on a little room. Because for me, I can't work on anything big. I can't be a blocker to other artists. So I've got a, a tiny little side room somewhere and I'll just, <laughs> when I have time after the feedback, after the managing, after the scheduling, whatever, I can noodle away and get something done for the location. So as the lead, you, you are still doing art from yeah. time to time. And, and as a lead, it is important that you are an artist and that you maintain your yeah. art skills and because you have to, it, you know it's it's difficult enough to manage people when you do know what their job is than when you don't know you know, you know uh, yeah, the, the tools that they're using and stuff yeah, like that yeah I, I think when uh, the kind of the further up the chain you go i think the bigger the picture is that you're looking to create so when you're first starting out you're deep in the tools, you're making the, the assets, you're thinking about where the, the trim lines are going, you're thinking about where the palm detail is going to go, you're thinking about the assets as individual things or, or working in a kit of parts. Um, as you continue to work on these locations and these environments, you, and the further you go up, you kind of move away from, you'll still have to do the little things, but you're also picking up speed as you're doing it, so it's less impactful. And then you can, you've got almost a bit more time to think about the bigger picture. So how are these things coming together? What does the composition look like? How is the lighting gonna work in this space? Um, so being very much kind of aware of, or yeah, keeping tabs on that, what are the fundamentals? Um, and less about the, the granularity of things and more about the big picture is. I think there's probably still some variation even within leads there. There are, it's, you know, I, it, your lead environment artist, I'm, uh, what, what's my title? Uh, creative content lead uh, and <laughs> whatnot. It's, it's the hard, one of the hardest things for me is delegating, is letting go. I, I, I still, I still often feel like I have to get my hands in there and I have to be, I, I have to be doing things. Uh, there are times when I know it will take me 10 minutes to explain a thing, but I could do it in five. Mm. So because I'm in a hurry or whatnot, I will choose to do the thing for, for, for this person and, and so that we can all move on, we can all make our dates, you know, the, the things, I, I cannot be a blocker when reality is the, the right choice was probably that I should have taken the 10 minutes to explain it and stuff. Yeah. It, it's balancing that is... It's so hard, yeah. I, I find that in previous roles I've been in, I've just been, I have been the same. I've, and you have to learn you have to go through and, and, and almost do it wrong to learn that, oh, I, I know I have to delegate this. And, and you know, delegation is, is fine. You, I want to, you know, my artists are trustworthy. You know, they deserve it. And ultimately, we can't make this project as individuals. You know, I can't make the entire UGFs on my own. Um, and that I wouldn't actually want to do that either. That sounds like it would never end. Um, 
but so you have to kind of say, okay, well, um, we've got this many artists and these are the rooms we've got. And what we do say is, you know, has anyone got any preference to what they want to work on? And if they do, then there you go. If not, then it really is just who did the white box for it, but also who's available. Um, because the more we can kind of keep people together, if they worked on something from white box all the way through to release, then that's like an amazing portfolio piece for them. And they did it all the way through. So we try and do that as much as we can, um, but otherwise it's sort of a lottery. Um, obviously, it, it also depends on experience. So if we have new starters, then they work on smaller things um, or more contained things, whereas uh, more seasoned artists will work on kind of bigger things. Let's talk about, by the way, if you're just joining us or whatnot, uh, we're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with lead environment artist John Griffiths here. We're talking about the very nature of game development today. Uh, if, if you're looking for updates on where's this feature or whatnot, I encourage you to look at Inside Star Citizen or the, the public roadmap. Um, I want to I, I wanna push into this, I want to continue on this Let's just see where I want to go with this here. Not everybody can work on everything. Not everybody should work on anything. Uh, once you've made the decision to be an artist, you mentioned that you started on characters and you really didn't like characters. Was that because you weren't good at characters or because they just didn't interest you or were you not good because they didn't interest you? And it, it was, it's all of those things. Um, I, so way, way back then, so I, when I was first looking for a job, all the jobs, all the junior positions were, you must have one year's experience. But the problem is, how do you get a year's experience without if getting the, hired, yeah. without getting hired? Anyway, um, I w did work, unpaid work experience on this animated film studio and it was two weeks and they were like there's no job and I was like fine and I was just like all I need is your name on my CV so I could say I've been here so I now have some experience anyway at the end of the um, two weeks they offered me they created a job for me um, which was my then my first job so you know that was great um, but I when I was on work experience I was baking animation and then I did a bit of prop, prop uh, modeling and texturing. And they really needed a character artist for their next film. So they were like, right, John, here you go. And I tried it, but I just felt like, well, characters never interested me. So I thought, well, I've got to keep this job now. So I'll just do what you say. Um, but. I've always been an environment person, all like throughout, like through my childhood and stuff. It was always, always about the world I was in rather than being a player or changing what my player looks like. Um, so when I actually started this character, yeah, I modeled it, but you could tell that I just didn't have an understanding of how to make a character look good. So it, yes, it had eyes and a mouth and a nose, and arms and stuff, but it was, that was it. There was no life in it. Um, so that, in a way, it was kind of a blessing in disguise that I tried it and in, in that, what, month, two months, I was kind of like, yeah, this isn't for me. And we weren't using ZBrush at the time for it, so it was very much modeling it in, in light waves, so in a, how you character do hard model, character yeah. modeling and life? I know, I know. Um, so really pushing those verts around. Um, yeah, it just it just wasn't for me. Um, so having that experience now, let's 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 take you back into the role as a lead. You're you've got to assign artists to tasks and stuff like this. At some point, as their lead, as you, as you work with them and stuff, you start discovering the talents of the people who work for you yeah, yeah. and the interests of the people that work for you. And how does, 
that factor into scheduling and assigning tasks? Is 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 it always just oh, well, you know, you have to work on this thing that you don't like because I need to get it done, or or do you or, or is there an effort to kind of put people where they're going to be the most effective? Yeah, I would say that there is an element of we need to get this done now, so you've just got to do it. Um, but that's generally when the deadline's getting nearer. Um, up until that point, it's, it is, you know, thinking about where people excel, where they, like you say, where they can be most effective, but also most successful. But having said that, we don't want, it's up to the artists themselves as well to kind of say, oh, I kind of want to push myself on this next one. Can I do this? And then we'll just bear that in mind when we are doing the scheduling um, or the assignment of, of tasks. Because, you know, ultimately, if you are just keep doing the same thing, yes, you're going to get really good at it and really fast at it. But you're also going to pigeonhole yourself as well. And, um, you know, ultimately, our teams might move around and we'll have different people and they'll all have different things they're good at or bad at. And... It's just we want to kind of have artists have, you know, maybe they've got one strong suit, but then the rest of what they work on is still good and there's no real kind of dropouts from that. There's got to be this, I mean, obviously, you know, we're having this conversation now, but I've had some variation of this conversation with, with folks here and other companies uh, over the years. You don't want to run a daycare you can you know people you, you can you only work on the things that you want to work on you only work on the things that you're good to work on but at the same time you want to pair people up with where they're going to be the most effective when possible it's like if i put you know if if, if, if i if i put uh tom on this task it would take him six weeks because this isn't where he's particularly strong. But if I put him over on this other task, he could get that done in three weeks because that happens to play to all of his strengths and maybe we save that first task for somebody else. But at the, same, uh, the flip side of that is, well, Tom's never going to get any better yeah. <laughs> at that other thing unless we put him on those things that he's less strong at. So, but then you have to <laughs> accept that it's going to take longer to have that thing developed, this is this is this is an eternal struggle within yeah. all game development. It, it's uh, I think for me, I've worked in a lot of places where there's been limited career development. You'd have one review a year, and you know you may as well roll a dice on how it's going to turn out. Um, even when you're doing great work, you know it, it, there's no guidance to it. Whereas now and what I want to do or will try to do is take into consideration people's careers and where they want to go with it. So yes, it might take this person six weeks, but they're never going to kind of grow as an artist unless they do do that. And, you know, we just balance it around. So if this takes longer here, then maybe their next thing is a lot shorter. So there's a bit of contrast to it. So they don't feel like they're bogged down in this one massive thing which has taken ages which they're not very good at. Um, these, these are the stories that don't get told. Uh, uh, that, you know, you, you, you watch a video from Activision or EA or whatnot, you, you, don't, you don't hear about these considerations. The, there's an assumption on the outside looking in, and I'm guilty of it too. When I look at cyberpunk or something, I, 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 I fall into these traps sometimes where you think the the only goal is to ship the finished product like that's the only that's the only consideration that matters but you know as 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 a business that's growing and wants to make this game and that game and then a game after that and stuff it's you you, you and you want to get better at this it's you need to grow your talent you need to keep your talent invested uh, you want to switch your talent around not just from the things that they're really good at to the things that they could get better at, but to also the things that interest them and to keep them from getting bored. Even the most talented individual can crank out crap mm -hmm. when they're disengaged, when it's like, oh, my fifth, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm on my fifth variation of 
uh, colonialism home, you know, homestead. I'm ready. I'm waiting for something else. I'm ready for something else. So it's it's there's all of these other considerations that go into everything from scheduling to staffing to uh, when we, uh, you know, what we put on the roadmap and what we choose to put into development and what not development. We're talking about it just from an art standpoint, but this applies to everything from design to programming. Even programmers get tired of working in the same systems you know, for a while and it's like, you know, and there's always that, there's those moments where you're like, yeah, but I need you to push through. It's like, this has yeah. to happen. There's too many other things. And those moments happen. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that they don't happen. There's moments where it's like, you know, like I said, we're not running a daycare. You got to, we need you to do this, do this thing and get it done. But you have to balance those with moments of we're going to find you an opportunity that challenges you in a different way and invigorates you in a different way. And it's always this delicate alchemy. <laughs> Mm. That, that goes on and, and never changes. And then anything else gets thrown in the mix. This person gets sick. Oh, this yeah. person like, transfers to another team or leaves the company for another opportunity. It's like this. It's and that th throws all the, the, the equation into, into chaos and stuff like this. And as a lead. Yeah, yeah, that, that whole thing. Uh, yeah, if, top tip, uh, please use your holiday. You know, it's there for a reason. Um, yeah, when, when the, you, you can't, you know, people have lives, yeah. you know, we've got to factor that in. Um, yeah, but something that reminded me when you were talking then was um, something that I try to do now is try to, I, I am quite transparent with my team and um, I think we all are, to be fair, with each of the leads. And for me, in my previous experience, it was... Generally, you know, let's, for example, you've got six weeks to work on this level, okay? So you work on it, and then, you, then they say, oh, it's another two weeks, or it's another two weeks, or, oh, now you need to move on to this level. But no one ever tell, told us about when it needed to be done by, or when is it actually being released, or is this going to be the day one patch or something? So I try to be, you know, all my artists know when the review gates are, uh, they know when we need to put the location out um, they know how long the you know what they're currently working on is going to what does the schedule say it should take and what do they think it will take and I think with that with that you know there's some stuff that I can't be transparent on um, but for the most part it's kind of like the more information they know the better decisions they can make about what it is they're actually working on and so hopefully that gives them a bit of headspace to, to do that as, you know, effectively as they can do. So you started, you said you started in film animation. Yeah. With this. Uh, the video game industry is notorious for this revolving door. It, it, it's it, within the industry and then into the industry and out of the industry and stuff. Pe people come into video games and they leave to do previs for Mandalorian or something. And then, you know, and they come back and they go and they, they try their hand Hollywood or any, anything else. What was it about video games that brought you here? And then what has kept you here so far? So I like probably everybody who works in the games industry they enjoyed playing video games when they grew up. And I really, yeah, I really enjoyed playing video games. And my, you know, my, my parents didn't think there was a career in video games. <laughs> they probably still don't. Um, but what kept me was that you're doing, and even, you know, in film, when I was watching, working in animated film, it's you're doing, you can create anything you want within the remit of the project. But then, you know, you've got your spare time. You can then create whatever you want if you're not doing that at work. Um, but it doesn't feel like I'm working because so, I, I love what I do. Um, and to be able to create whatever I want and even just move inverts around and stuff like that, it, it's kind of therapeutic in a way. Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> there are days, I, you know, in the game... We, we're an industry like any other. You have good days and you have bad days. And sometimes you're, you know, you're beating your head against a rock for eight hours and it's horrible. 
But then, you know, for the most part, I would say for 90% of the time, it's we're, we're doing things that we all enjoy. And then, you know, we can then go and play this game after and be like, hey, look, that's the thing I did. Hey, look, mom, get the camera. Um, so that's why I love it. I, I actually, um, when I was first looking for a job, I wanted to go into the games industry. But as I said, the... I couldn't get a job in the games industry off the bat, so I worked in animated film. And then um, I came to a point where it was good to just move over into games. And when I got there, it, it was great. But I think when I got here, CIG was just starting up. Um, so, you know, joining at that time for me would have been a, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, so you got to the game industry, you mean? Yeah, yeah, games industry, yeah. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of transferable skills and tools between both things, especially now. Um, so I feel like you can change, you know, more frequently. I once worked as technical support for a prosthetic limb company where I was dealing with doctors and helping them figure out how to get the proper measurements and, and figure out why their prosthetic legs weren't working and whatnot. And the amount of times a month, well, I won't say it happened every day or even every week, but there's at least one or two times a month, and I've been here for over eight years, where some solution or some way that I've had to deal with something, I could trace back to a lesson I learned dealing with doctors people who had all the training in the world and thought they knew better than everything else. Like, well, actually, you know, you sent centimeters and not millimeters. You know, just, just simple, you know, stupid things like that. It's the, there is shared experience in almost anything that, that you do. It's one of the great challenges of coming into the game industry or any industry is finding, is, is figuring out where your experiences from these mm. other jobs you've done, uh, these other careers you've had, can apply and can help you uh, doing this. Uh, and it's, you never really know where, uh, wh where that key experience that's gonna solve your problem here comes from. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always moderately surprised when I, go back, when I go back to something dumb like that. Like, oh yeah, I spent, I spent four months you know, yelling at doctors for not knowing how to use a tape measure. And it, it, it helps me quite a bit in these things. So does uh, teaching high school, for reasons I probably don't have to explain. Uh. I did actually have um, a stint in VR as well. And in a way I was kind of like, that's, so I took this position because it, they were offering me a senior role. So I was like, yes, please. I'm not gonna get one here. So <laughs> I went there and, um, or rather I'm not, I'm not going to get one here, it's the wrong. It was more, they were rolling the dice at that company on who got senior. And it was just like, I don't really want to be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this role, I, I'm being offered it, I'm going. So that was great. So what I was doing was a virtual reality uh, training simulator for emergency services. And it was great managing, uh, like a, so I was, went on as senior but became lead and I was managing a small team there. But the reason why I came back to games was because that was very much real world. Um, just it had to be, you know, realistic, yes, but realistic to the world we live in rather than, you know, like this universe we're creating. And I just found it a bit boring. And so I was just like, with the games industry, it's super creative. You know, you're working with, yes, artists, but also designers and you know, how about we do it this way or can we try it like this? And, and um, oh, what if the gravity's turned off type of thing? You're like, that's really great. And that would, that would not even be an option in that job. So um, I took a little stint out and I was like, yeah, this isn't for me, came back. <laughs> and with Star Citizen, you have the added wrinkle of the community being involved in this while you're making it. Watching them my every move. <laughs> you know, you know it, it's, if, if, you, if, if, if you took a look at the chat from the stream today, uh, there's, there's, I think, who, who said it best? Uh, Airborne, I think it was Airborne. Yeah, it says chat PVP is real. Uh, yeah, there's been some, uh, there's definitely been some uh, PVP going on in the chat this show. Uh, as long as you guys entertain, are entertained, that's all I care about. Maybe I'll read, so, I'll watch it. 
later today and, uh, you know, cringe at watching myself, but read the comments as well. And that's how you know I'm getting old when I have to take my glasses off in order to see the screen that's right in front of me. Um, so let's, let's, we're, we're almost out of time. Let's, let's talk about that effect. So, so obviously we take feedback from, you know, any, uh, or we're always open to the better idea. Uh, uh, you know, uh, artist ones can suggest things, art, you know, seniors, leads, and everything. It's, it's even I've been known to pop in every once in a while and you should do this or whatever. And, and then I see a thing in the game that, that came from a silly, stupid side comment I made in a meeting I probably shouldn't have talk, uh, spoken up in. I'm like, oh crap, I'm not supposed to have that kind of effect. Uh, talk to me about the effect of the community in this. It, it, it's, it's, we just, we just did two weeks with Duncan uh, Bunting on Arena Commander, and uh, it's very clear to see how the community has influenced Arena Commander uh, and a lot of these changes that are, co that are coming with, with 320 and, and, and stuff like this. Um, with environment art, where, where, where it's more... The, 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 the space around you, not necessarily you know, gameplay stuff. Is there room for community feedback in environment art? Probably. <laughs> you know, you could feedback on anything if you wanted, but the decision lies with us at the end of the day, whether we go for it or not. Don't get me wrong, it's great to hear, you know, when people record videos and they talk about the architecture of the game, and how the, it would actually work in our world, that's super positive for us because it's kind of like, oh yeah, you know, we thought this looked right ourselves and felt right, but to see that the community also agrees with us kind of helps that, you know, feeling that, oh, we are doing this thing right. This, that's just, just keep going with it. Um, obviously, if there's something, well, hopefully nothing would get into the game that is really wrong, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there was like a, a 10 foot uh, scale ref guy outside of Lawville recently. So yeah, that's obviously <laughs> not great. Um, but you know, when, you know, if we... If scale ref is the thing that you, that, that you put in while you're working. Yeah, just, was, yeah, and yeah. You left, and somebody left it in. Someone left it in and scaled up for some reason. <laughs> so, um, so the scale ref... So it wasn't even the right scale. Um, but, um, you know... We were highlight the community highlighted that to us, and that's great. Um, so we are able to then go in and remove that thing. What's the more What's the more egregious error there? The fact that a scale reference was left in, or the fact that a scale reference was misscaled? I what's think the more it's egregious? The misscaled scale ref, because if you're not even using the right scale, then how do you know it all works? in the world together. Yeah, so I think for me, leave it in. Uh, <laughs> just make him tidy. <laughs> we won't call them out live, but will you tell me who it was after the show so I can just give them shit? I don't know who it was. They'll tell me after yeah. the show. Yeah. Uh, lastly, uh, before we let you go, uh, we don't get to have you on a, 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 a whole lot. Um, you want to give us a general update? I, I know folks know that you're working on, uh, you know, the underground facilities and what. Uh, uh, what are you working on? And in the general, how's it going? How are you feeling about it? Feeling pretty good. Yeah. Um, tell us what you're working on first, and then tell us how you feel. So I have been working on Excel. <laughs> uh, no, I've been. We've been doing some scheduling. Um, and just checking that what we want to release with is still possible, and it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then factoring in, well, from a time point of view, can we delve a bit deeper and actually just check the numbers all work? Um, you know, from a team position, we're, we've moved into first pass, so the art is now going in, and um, it's really, really great and inspiring to see what the artists are actually creating, what they're coming up with. Um, you know, I had a, we had a sprint review yesterday and I was playing around the space. And even now when some rooms are kind of in a halfway house where there's still white box, but there's some art in there and other rooms are more complete and more first pass art. And even having those, those rooms that are more further along in, I'm playing around it. I'm just thinking, yeah, this is working. We're, we're, this is going in the direction we want it to go in. So, 
Yeah. I had a you made me think of a follow up question that I, I I forgot I lost it halfway through. Uh, John. Thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to be here. Uh, I know we got to get you going. We're a little earlier this week than we normally are because you know we got places we need you to be. Um, that's John Griffiths, a lead environment artist on the EU Sandbox. One or two? Two. Two. Two team. Sandbox uh, team. Uh, currently working on underground facilities and some other stuff that I'm sure you'll hear the about. The better in, sandbox team. In, 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 well, I'm sorry. What? what? Nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Did you say the better sandbox? No, no, I'd never say something like that live. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Sandbox one are pretty awesome. They're the original sandbox. I'm the one who starts shit here, not you. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen it, check out uh, Inside Star Citizen this week with part two of the fantastic arena commander changes that are going in, uh, are scheduled to go in for Alpha 320. Uh, come back next week. Uh, next week is our yearly Alien Week uh, uh, festivities, uh, where we'll be talking, we'll be updating on, uh, let's see, in ISC, we're updating on the Santok Yai. Uh, so you'll get, to, you'll get to see how that's progressing in a, uh, a very candid conversation that you would think would probably more, be more appropriate for this show, but we'll put it on that show because why the heck not. Uh, and then uh, while we're at it, we're also going to update on the whole C uh, uh, next, next week. Uh, it's not really an alien ship, but you know I do what I want. Uh, it's, it's also scheduled to come with uh, Alpha 320, so check that out for, uh, on Inside Star Citizen next week. And then we'll be right back here with members of the narrative team uh, next, year, uh, next week where they'll be doing their yearly Q&A on all things alien. Uh, for Alien Week. So uh, for all of Clyde Imperium Games, I'm Jared Huckabee. Thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for uh, 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 humoring us while we, while we took a little detour this week to talk about the very nature of game development and address some curiosities and functionalities of the process that I don't think uh, most other studios would ever you know, deign to discuss. Mm. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody.